Hello there and welcome to another casual valuation. This time it's Sprouts Farmers Market, a company just simply known as Sprouts. And it is a very boring company and you will see throughout the video why I mean that. But boring companies can turn out to be great investments and we should not, of course, dismiss the company only on that basis. So the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at the share price and then we're going to dive into the fundamentals to understand what the company does, how it makes money, how it grows. Then we're going to value the company based on assumptions that I think are fair, but also based on assumptions that are different than mine. So if you fall into some other category, then you can take a look at the value based on your assumptions as well. Now, share price wise, it is up 9% in the last five years without any dividend yield, so not paying out dividends. Um, it's not a great share price performance and definitely not even close to the S&P 500. And if you take a look at the price, it seems volatile, but it is almost always within this 20 to $30 range, except in two cases. The first one is beginning of 2020, when we had the beginning of the COVID-19 and beginning of 2022. We have an increase and it's for the first time in this five years period that it went over $35 a share. But since then, it's again now back down to its usual level of $25, $26 a share. From a market cap point of view, it is a relatively small company, less than $3 billion of market cap. For the PE ratio, of course, we cannot make any conclusions solely based on that. So we're going to take a look into the fundamentals to understand a little bit uh, better what we can expect from a company such as this one. So let's get started. First of all, what is Sprout and how does it make money? Now, in a nutshell, it is a grocery store chain. It features an open layout and it has fresh produce at its heart. Now, what's worth mentioning is that this fresh produce comes from the local farmers and it first moves into their distribution centers. And from there, it moves to the individual stores. Now, their goal is to have a distribution center within a 250 miles or 400 kilometers radius of all the stores. At the moment, that's not the case. It's at around 85% of the stores within that radius, which means in order to, to get to their, that goal, they need to just build more distribution centers over time. Now, locally sourced produce, um, there's some pros and cons. And um, of course, the, the pros is basically you have something that's fresh and you don't have any global supply chain exposure. So if something goes wrong in, in China or Asia, since Sprouts is only in the US, it does not affect uh, the way that it operates. It doesn't affect the way that the produce is being distributed. It, it literally has no exposure. However, of course, it is more expensive as some of the, um, some of the produce can be sourced from outside of the US at a cheaper price. But of course, then you get lower quality. So you always have this trade off between the, the quality of, of a certain product and the price. Now, it's worth mentioning that it's not, that's not the only thing that they sell. In fact, uh, they provide this kind of a simple overview of the products that, that you can find in, in their stores. You have perishable and non-perishable products. I don't want to go into too much detail there, but it's just good to mention that it's not only about the, the products that come from the local farmers. So how does a company such as this one grow? How does any retail store grow? First of all, Intuitively, we would say, well, the more stores they have, the more revenue they bring in. And that's not wrong. Of course, that, that is absolutely correct. The second variable here is, and this is a formula that I, I came up with, and I think that it makes sense, is the average revenue per store. If you have more stores, but every store that you have sells less, well, the revenue is not going to go up as much. And then you, we have the third segment, which especially in the last decade is more important. That's e-commerce also for, for retail stores and grocery stores. At the moment, that's around 10% of the total revenue. So not that significant number. And I don't think it will grow too much um, only because we saw huge expansion uh, during COVID. And now it's come, kind of coming back to the more sustainable level. And we don't see any trend of, of increasing the e-commerce. And that's not only related to Sprouts, but just in general for, for, for companies in this industry. Now, let's first start at the number of stores. As you can see, 2017, they had 285. 
Then the next year, 313, 340, 2021 at year end, 374. Of course, growing the number of stores on its own, if they're not successful, is basically destroying value. So what we need to understand is what is the impact of these new stores on the financials? And we're going to take a look into that. But if a company, if a store doesn't perform well, one of the solutions that they have is just to close it. And what you'll see is that in 2018, they closed two stores. 2019, they closed one store. So that's three in total in the last five years. Taking into account that they have over 300 stores, percentage-wise, that's not much, which means the management does a really good job assessing the location, the, dem the demographics, the competition in certain areas, maybe also the, the spending on, on this type of products and the decision where to open a store so far seems, uh, seems quite good because they are growing at a sustainable pace without closing too many stores due to, again, poor performance. Now, what's next for them is, is very important because they are aiming to increase the unit growth, so the number of stores, 10% or more per year beyond 2022. So as of 2023, which means if they have 400 stores at the moment, that's pretty much an increase of 40 new stores in, let's say, 2023, 2024, and so on. But also, they want to increase, sorry, to decrease the store size from 30,000 to 23,000 square feet or from 2,800 to, say, 2,200 square meters. And this is important because if I go to the previous slide, what you'll notice here is that the average revenue per store is flat over time, over these five years. But so initially, intuitively, we would say, well, they are not really selling more through their original stores. But think about it. If the new store is smaller in size and it brings in about the same amount of revenue or combined with all the other stores, the revenue per store is, is at the same level, that's not bad because smaller stores, first of all, have lower investments required to get it up and running. Then second, we have lower operating expenses. So that's not necessarily bad. And that's why we should sometimes see both sides. And, and, and sometimes it turns out like this, we cannot really make a conclusion about the average revenue per store. We have to take a look at all the stores combined and then draw a conclusion whether it's moving into the right direction or not. And then there's, it's worth mentioning that they have private label offering, the Sprouts branded products. Currently around 16% of the revenue is coming from the sale of these type of products. And this is increasing. So the percentage is, is increasing over time. Every time that a company has a kind of a private label offering, that means that the price that is the selling price towards the, the final consumers is, is lower. Yet their margin is either same or in most cases even higher than it would have been if they were selling a third party product. So this is something that's actually quite good. And um, as long as this percentage grows over time, it's, it's, it's amazing for, for Sprouts. And I think the management does a really good job in, in this case. So let's take a look at the historical financial performance for all of the stores combined and so not on the number of stores of so the average revenue just all together everything combined assuming that it's just one company which it is 2017 net sales below 5 billion 2021 over 6 billion the average revenue growth was roughly 7% year over year and it seems that here 2021 we have a drop so why do we have this drop well first of all 2020 was a year where we had inflated revenue because of COVID-19. So that is the first case. And the second one is they're reporting the, the, the numbers on a given year based on e and a certain number of weeks. So it's, of course, in a, in a year we have 52 weeks or 53 weeks, depending on where we do the rounding. So 2020 was basically calculated on 53 weeks. So one week more compared to the year before and after. Um, and of course, if that was not the case, um, the, this decline instead of, I think it's now like around five, five, five and a half percent, it would have been four percent. So it would have looked as the decline is a little bit lower, even though yeah, it just shifted between the two years. 
Now, at the same time, they managed to improve the gross margin from a 33.5 to over 36%. So that is quite good. And of course, since 36% is already relatively low, that's not surprising. Every, every retail company or every company in this industry, it's known to have lower low margins. And if we take a look at the operating uh, profit, it's even lower. I mean, significantly lower. Of course, uh, between the gross margin and the operating margin, we have all these other operating costs. First of all, the expenses for the employees, so salaries, wages, share-based compensations, which is not that high. Then we have certain advertising costs. We have the pre-opening costs for the new stores. We have rent, we have taxes, property taxes, I mean by that, insurance, maintenance, and, and a lot of other small costs that just contribute. And this small contribution of this operating margin, as you can see around 5%, 2017, now 5.5%. It is improved in this period. The management aims to get it to 6%. Um, but you, we cannot expect any, anything different. We cannot, if, if we expect, if we forecast 10% margin, it's just not possible. It, it's just unrealistic. So we have to keep in mind that the margin has to remain within this range, I'd say between 5 and 6%. Um, so... Let's take a look at the balance sheet quickly. This would not take a lot of time because there are only a couple of points that are worth mentioning. The first one is that it is fairly simple. Uh, we can easily follow what's happening in the last years. And here I've included the last 12 months. So that's as of Q1 2022, as those are the most recent uh, numbers available. First of all, I'd like to point out to the level of inventory. So we know that they have grown in terms of the number of stores and the inventory per store has decreased from 0.81 million to 0.7 million. So we have a, a decrease when it comes to the inventory per store, yet the average revenue per store remains flat. So the inventory management and the turnover has improved in these last five years. And that is actually quite good. So again, shout out to the management. They're really doing a good job when it comes to finding these improvements. Um, the second point or the last point here that is worth mentioning is it, here it seems that something crazy happened when it comes to the property plant and equipment. That is only due to the introduction of the new accounting standard that um, is related to leases and they're now placed on the balance sheet. Of course, on this side, we have an increase of 1 billion, which pretty much also means that majority of their properties are being leased. And on the other side, we'll see a 1 billion increase uh, when it comes to the lease liabilities. Um, the goodwill remains the same, so no acquisition um, done, and, and I actually quite like that. So they're really just growing by creating or opening new stores and doing something that is proven that works for them. On the liabilities and equity, so we were expecting to see the 1 billion increase. Here it is, the capital leases, 119 to 1.1 billion. That is the non-current portion, and of course we have about 100 million in the current portion so nothing nothing out of the ordinary um, for the rest everything looks quite good they don't have a lot of debt 250 million so even reduced over time um, and what's interesting is that they have repurchased 52 million shares which cost them about 1.2 billion which led to 34 percent reduction of shares outstanding and normally the process of share repurchases is basically there's a a certain amount that is being approved that the management can use to buy back shares. At the moment, they have the approval. They have the authorized repurchase program that has almost $600 million still remaining uh, that they can use for the same for this purpose. So I would expect that in the future, we do see a lot more um, buybacks because they are cash flow positive companies. So they're they're making money from the operations. They are reinvesting a lot back through opening new stores, but it's not as much. So they still have a lot of free cash flow left. So would not be surprised to see more buybacks in, in the future. Now, what are the analysts expecting in terms of revenue? 2022, about 4%. 2023, 6 7%. The management guidance is actually around 4%. It was actually on the lower side. And... It's, it's not, of course, surprising. Again, we're looking into the 
2020, 2021, still being kind of after the COVID period. So we have this cool down period because of the inflated sales before that. And then after that, depending on the growth um, coming from new stores. But as we know, they're aiming for 10% plus increase in the number of units. So it's not, it's not unrealistic to expect 6-7% growth. Now, normally I, I want to be more conservative and uh, we know that we're currently in a bit more challenging environment. So my assumptions are 4% for next year. I, I think that's quite, quite a good um, assumption because it's, again, not only the analyst, but the management is, is aiming for that. That's what they're forecasting. Then I'm not going to go above 6% only because I'm not sure how well these new stores will operate. Yes, they have almost 400, but once you put a target to open 10% more, it, it's kind of, you know, the management is being held accountable for that. And if they come with 5% more, they are not reliable, but if so, they would have, um, um, they, they will be aiming to get a 10% increase in the number of stores, but that puts just a lot more pressure. If, if they don't find the, the right location, which choice do they make? So do they disappoint on, on the words that they've said or do they disappoint financially? I'm not sure. So I'm going to expect that in any case, um, the revenue might not grow as much as, as one would expect. I could be wrong. Of course, they could do a great job and that the revenue grows by 10%. But I want to be on the safe side. And of course, at the end, we will see how the valuation works with a, with a much higher revenue growth. For the operating margin, yes, 6% is something that is being kind of targeted long run, but it's difficult to achieve and they have not achieved that in the, in, in the past. So, I mean, they have to find that improvement and I, they have not found it yet. So for me, the 5.5% is, is a better assumption because that's what the company has proven that is able to do. Now, what's interesting about the capital asset pricing model is that Oftentimes you stumble upon something that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Either that's a very low or even negative beta or just that the outcome doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you take a look at the calculation, the weighted average cost of capital is actually below 5%. And we do know that the company was not that much volatile. So it could also be, um, the argument could be made that it was a store of value because it just up 10% over the last five years. It didn't fluctuate that much, although it was 20, 30% up and down. But still, it, it always came to that level. So comparing that to the volatility of S&P 500, it seems a lot less riskier. However, we know that at the moment we have the, the increase in the, in, the, in the treasury bonds and the treasury rates. So we know that over time, we cannot expect the 5%. So the weighted average cost of capital based in, in my um, DCF model basically increases over time based on first... Um, the volatility, I don't think that 0.6%, what used to be historically, is going to remain for the future. It could be for many reasons. But also the risk-free rate is increasing over time. So assuming that there's a beta of one and Sprouts is as risky as the average company in the market and increasing the risk-free rate over time, it, more appropriate weighted average cost of capital in the long run is actually closer to 11%. Again, this in today's market. That's, uh, that, seems to be, uh, that seems to be fair. So how, how the numbers uh, develop over time, right? So first we have about 6.1 billion in revenue last 12 months, 4% growth next year, 6% after that, and then again, slight decrease over time. That leads to revenue growth by 62% in the next 10 years. This is my margin, so 5.5% throughout the entire period. I did mention that it's a boring company, then the additional reinvestment this is, of course, opening new stores, inventory that's needed. Maybe they, they buy some of the properties. Who knows? Uh, probably not, but always an option. And then they have the free cash flow, about 200 to growing to 300 million. So it is actually quite, quite a good yield compared to the market cap. Um, and the valuation looks like this. So terminal value, almost 4 billion discounted today, 2.1 billion. And since it's generating positive free cash flow in, in this 10 year span, the present value is 1.7. So the value that comes from the next 10 years is actually very high compared, of course, as if we compare that to the total value of the company, uh, the, of the operating part of it. So 3.7 billion. And 
that's not that often the case. So it's it's interesting to see that um, these kind of more boring companies seem to have much more stable and more predictable cash flow. Um, and yet, of course, the, we still see sometimes these movements, again, for these companies between $20 and $30 a share. There's still quite some volatility and we don't see that in the financial. So it's difficult to explain what, what drives those short-term movements. Of course, there's the cash, $343 million, minus debt, $1.5 billion, again, including long-term debt and leases. They don't have a lot of equity options outstanding, $45 million. That brings the value of equity or the company as a whole to $2.5 billion. Now, that's still below the $3 billion of market cap. Uh, number of shares, 100, almost 110 billion, with 110 million. Value per share is roughly $23 a share. Currently, stock is trading at 25.7. So it is actually close. It's a little bit, um, seems overvalued, but of course, I'm using a little bit more conservative assumption. So if we take a look at the numbers using a little bit more different assumptions, for example, if we use a 6% uh, operating margin, then we get to uh, basically the company being fairly valued with my assumptions when it comes to the revenue. Of course, if the revenue grows faster, let's say in pace with the number of stores that are being opened, then we're looking more into the 26 to 30, 35 even maybe um, fair value. But it's I always want to be on the safe side. So every time that I'm making um, assumptions about the future, I look at what the company has achieved and what is what is possible to be achieved with high level of or high probability. And for me, that is, of course, the 62% revenue growth with the 5.5%. Um, it's interesting that, of course, based on all of these assumptions, we see that it's, let's say, between 20 and, again, between 20 and 30, $35. So it's been trading within this range all the time. Um, and to be honest, what I like about the company is the management has done so many good decisions. They have not grown through acquisitions, which is which I personally really like. Um, they have not closed too many stores. I mean, three stores out of 400, that's in, in five years, that's great. Opening so many and, and increasing the margins at the same time, all looks great. And if this company falls down to 15 or, 15 or 18 or $20 a share, I'll definitely consider um, opening up a position in there. But yeah, for now, I think it's, it is a, a maybe fairly valued or close to that, but it's not a company that um, I can expect to, to return 15-20% uh, return in terms of short share price uh, over time. Of course, the share buybacks uh, are, are a great use of the, of the funds. Uh, it could be that they just switch a lot more of, from, from share buybacks to actually spending money or investing and, and opening new location, especially from 2023 onwards. That would be all regarding this video. Thank you very much for following it until the very end. Please let me know in the comments what you think of this company as well as if you have other companies that you'd like me to value. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one.